I remember when doing bubbles with the children was fun. Now, put the words bubble and children in a sentence together and I get this impending sense of doom. I've just spent the last 10 days looking after a three-year-old whose bubble was shut down. Finally, he's gone back to nursery and I have this overwhelming sense of freedom, despite the fact we're still in the middle of a national lockdown. What does it mean? It's Friday the 22nd of January 2021 and this is the Hot Topics Podcast. Hello, it's Neil Tucker here from MB Medical. Thanks for joining us on the Hot Topics podcast once again. This, of course, as you will have noticed, is a belated first of 2021. So happy new year, everyone. Now, I had meant to do this podcast two weeks ago, but fate got in the way. First, two Fridays ago, my wife went to work. She's a GP locally, did a lateral flow test. It came back positive. So she called me just as my key was going in the front door, having dropped the kids off at school. I didn't even take my coat off. I just trudged back and went and got them. Of course, the PCR test showed that it was a false positive the next day. But worse was to come. So someone in my three-year-old's nursery school group was diagnosed with COVID and the bubble was shut down and the kids all had to isolate for 10 days. It is a complete nightmare trying to work from home with a three-year-old around. In fact, such a nightmare that you basically have to just give up. I now have extreme empathy for anyone who has young children and a non-key worker job. The last year has been a nightmare for you. And things start off quite well. So once you've accepted that you're not going to actually get any meaningful work done, I'm not going to write that Hot Topics course, I can't do that podcast then you can kind of move on from that and you can start enjoying yourself. You can do those little things, spend that bit of time with your child that you maybe don't get to do on a regular basis. So we had fun drawing and making and playing, at least for the first few days. By day nine, everyone's just shouting at each other constantly and the noise, don't even get me started on the noise, even sat here, I'm having flashbacks to yesterday and the noise So let's park that. I need to move on. I need to do my own personal talking therapy, which today means we are going to talk about coronavirus variants and what this means for rates of reinfection and the vaccines that we're currently delivering. We're going to have a look at the new GP contract for 2021-22, which segues nicely into a new Lancet paper on obesity management. We're also going to have a look at a BMJ paper on the use of antidepressants for back pain and sciatica. And then I think we'll round up with something very topical for me, which is parental burnout. It's all going on today. Now, many of you out there will be doing COVID vaccination clinics throughout the week, throughout the weekends. You may have been doing them for for a whole month now. I dare say if that's the case, you've got things pretty slick, which is great news. I know many of you out there, the logistics don't work, the staffing doesn't work, the money doesn't work, and the clinics have been a non-starter. But if you do get the opportunity to do one, then I really encourage you to have a go. Sure, the work is easy, and there's no doubt you don't need a doctor to be delivering all of these vaccinations. In fact, it doesn't really make any sense at all to have GPs doing immunisation clinics But if you want something to help with the January lockdown pandemic blues, then this is the antidote. I doubt we'll ever get the opportunity again to have so many patients be so happy and so grateful at any one time. And it's just really nice to have that feeling of positivity once again. It's nice to be able to see some of your colleagues as well, face to face as opposed to on Teams. The only slight downer on the day was one gentleman who came in and said, well, I'll have the vaccine, but I'm not sure there's any point. Not with this South African and Brazilian variant coming around. I hear it's absolutely no good against them at all. Clearly, he'd been hoping for just good old fashioned UK COVID, born and bred, which in classic British style might perpetually self-deprecate until it simply turns into the common cold. But unfortunately, even Brexit hasn't been enough to keep these other variants out. So is he right? And are these vaccinations that we're spending an extraordinary amount of energy in delivering, 
actually a giant waste of time. Well, there's been a fantastic series of articles in New Scientist this week, talking to experts in genomics and virology to really try and understand a little bit more about what's the likely consequence of these variants. And I know that we'll all have been reading about this in the news over the last two or three weeks, but I think this does provide us with a bit more scientific background about what we can expect. So, of course, there's a big focus on the three strains. There's the UK variant, the South African variant, and now the Brazilian variant. But don't get conned into thinking that these are the only variants of coronavirus that have evolved over the last 12 months. Because, actually, if you go to a really interesting website called nextstrain.org, so this is where scientists have formed a family tree of this coronavirus, of SARS-CoV-2. And what's immediately apparent is that there's hundreds of different offspring, there's hundreds of different variants, there's multiple different branches which then form their own branches and and so the variants continue. And even this, although it sounds like quite a lot, in the context of many viruses, this is considered quite um, slow evolution. Now the good news is that most of these variations are very subtle and they don't affect the effect that the virus has on us. And that's why these three variants that have been talked about a lot stand out because their changes do make a difference. So the big spike in cases that we've seen in the UK at the moment is not simply down to a failure of social distancing, the Christmas effect, schools and universities going back at the end of last year. Uh, It really is because of the change in the spike protein within the virus increasing the transmissibility. And new scientists gave a simple calculation to demonstrate the size of the effect that these changes in transmissibility have. And it is terrifying. So if we assume that the infectivity rate is about 1.1, so each infected person infects 1.1 other people on average, which is um, that's that's worked out as the low end of the estimated rate of infection in um, England at the moment. Take 10,000 people. After one month, you'd have 16,000 infections. Increase the transmissibility by 50%. And that 16,000 cases at one month goes up to 122,000 cases. So it becomes really easy to see why increased transmissibility is much more of a problem for a country, for a health service, for the NHS, for our hospitals, for us in general practice, than any change in a virus that would increase its fatality rate. Now, the UK variant has one major mutation in the spike protein. It's already been widely reported that scientists feel that this isn't going to be enough to reduce the efficacy of our current vaccines. But the South African and Brazilian variants have three major mutations. In fact, they're both very similar to each other. These two variants have been spreading faster than the early strains of SARS-CoV-2 and lab studies seem to suggest that this is because the virus has now become 20% better at evading immunity in previously infected people. The mutations change the binding domain where antibodies would normally lock on and therefore it reduces the neutralising effect of those antibodies by about 10 times. So that sounds pretty scary, but what we haven't actually seen is a systematic increase in reinfections around the world, particularly when they've looked at South Africa. That doesn't seem to have happened. And that's because of two things. So even though the neutralising activity of antibodies is reduced, there's still plenty enough to clear out most infections and prevent reinfection. And of course, immunity is not just about antibodies. We've still got our plucky little T cells, which we know have a big effect on combating the infection. And they've been shown to have enduring immunity for six to eight months at least, and hopefully for many of us much longer. So it's good news. The vaccines will still work. What we're doing does make a difference. And it really does make a big difference to people's lives. We've been vaccinating people who haven't been out of their building for the last 10 months. We're giving them a little ray of hope in what's been a really dismal year. The only downside, well, the more we vaccinate, the more selection pressure that puts on the virus, the more that encourages new variants. But look, let's not worry about things that have yet to happen. And the vaccine can always be tweaked for new variants in any case. This remains our best chance out of this pandemic. 
Now I see the details for the new GP contract, at least in England, for 21-22 have just been released this week. And you've probably already seen the headline, so I'm not going to spend a whole heap of time on this, but we've had um, some of the new PCN service specifications postponed. That's uh, obviously a no-brainer. Only a madman would think that we need to add weight to PCNs when we're rolling out the biggest vaccination program in the history of the UK and doing a very good job of it. And I dare say for many PCNs around England, this has actually been the first time they've successfully managed to work together. In fact, it may be the making of PCNs. So thank goodness the powers that be are not going to try and wreck it now by increasing the burden even further. On a positive note for PCNs, they're now going to be able to use their money to employ mental health practitioners as well, which I don't know why they didn't do this from the start. That's an obvious area that needs a lot of assistance that PCNs could make a big difference with. So that's really, really welcome. And then there's the inevitable small amount of churn with quaff. But as part of that, and something the BMA has come out to say they can't support, is um, quaff incentivization for GP practices to be referring patients with obesity. And possibly linked with that, there may be a new enhanced service on obesity and weight management. Now, this is a really tricky one. We know obesity drives medical illness and has a negative effect on people's quality of life. Arguably, then, it falls under the remit of health. I've seen some people argue that it shouldn't do because ultimately it's a lifestyle choice. I don't really buy that argument because I don't believe for many people that obesity, which is not necessarily the same as a raised BMI, but obesity, I think, often is not a choice for people. I think it's driven by a variety of complex interacting factors, including socioeconomic issues, but also genetics and the interplay of gut hormones. It's complex. We don't understand it all. Losing weight is very hard at the best of times. And I'm just not convinced that in the current model of general practice, us pushing weight loss clinics on people who may, may be a bit overweight is likely to be a very effective strategy. Governments should be doing much more. They should be doing better education and more physical exercise in schools. They should be improving school meals. How hard can that be? Why haven't they done that? We've been talking about it for decades. We need to make active commuting easier and safer for people so that they get out of their cars. You need to adequately fund grass level sports so everyone can get involved. They need to hold food and drinks manufacturers to account so that they can reduce the amount of crap that they put in their processed foods. But taking part of our practice funding and forcing us to force patients to go to a clinic that they don't want to attend and so will do badly at, I'm not convinced that's the right approach. Don't get me wrong, I'm not entirely negative about weight loss programmes and indeed even even NHS funded programmes can be effective. But there's a few things we have to bear in mind. So, for example, there was a Lancet paper in 2017 that compared a brief intervention on weight loss to a 12 week weight loss programme to a 52 week a weight loss program all funded by the NHS and they found that at one year the brief intervention group lost almost four kilograms the 12 week group lost almost five kilograms and the 52 week group lost almost seven kilograms which even though it would cost more to keep running longer was found to be cost effective overall. We know from the direct study in the Cambridge edition study that very low energy liquid diets can be very effective for people with obesity and type 2 diabetes at putting the diabetes into remission and for many this was enduring weight loss and they still were in remission at five years of follow-up. It's welcome that this style of intervention is now going to be widely available on the NHS but we need to make sure we learn the lesson that ongoing support is needed for the best outcomes and indeed even longer ongoing support than the year that they had in the trials might well be a good thing it might well lead to further benefits and while we're thinking about weight loss interventions let's not forget the role of surgery so whilst I dare say that for most people doing bariatric surgery 
uh, may not be the preferred option. Uh, a new paper published in The Lancet just today just shows at 10 years of follow-up the levels of benefit in people who have had metabolic surgery compared with conventional medical therapy. So overall, the, the surgery is more effective than drug therapy in the long-term control of type 2 diabetes more than a third were still in remission from diabetes at 10 years compared with just 5% of those who had conventional medical therapy. Unsurprisingly, the rate of adverse effect is greater in the surgical group and one hopes that many of those patients these days might be managed on the very low energy liquid diets in conjunction with good ongoing support. But for those who really struggle with this, for those where that's just not proving effective, let's not forget surgery as a very, very valid option. Now, I did say I was going to talk about a BMJ paper that published this week on the role of antidepressants in back pain, sciatica and osteoarthritis. Now, given the fact that recent guidelines have basically said we can't use any medications that we traditionally have done for these conditions... Wouldn't it be great if antidepressants were actually found to be helpful? So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis, including 33 trials, mostly looking at duloxetine, some of them looking at amitriptyline. And this paper is an example of how to really, really confuse people. So in their conclusions, there's a lot of double negatives. So, for example, for SNRIs in the management of osteoarthritis, they report they cannot exclude a clinically important effect. So I scratched my head with this one. Does that mean that they have found a clinically important effect? But that doesn't really sound like what they mean. It sounds like they mean it's probably rubbish. They've also reported that for back pain, SNRIs show a small effect on back pain but it's not clinically important. So again, I think we can class them as rubbish. And then tricyclics and SSRIs may be effective for sciatica. Well, we have used amitriptyline a lot for sciatica in the past, but the certainty of evidence range from low to very low. So make of that what you will. I'm guessing, given that it's sciatica, it's miserable, lots of people want some help, and we have very few other options, you're probably going to keep prescribing even if things are uncertain. The linked editorial even suggests that despite the uncertainty, it may still be worth prescribing, citing the old adage, expect analgesic failure, pursue analgesic success. But more and more, I'm mindful of the fact that over half of people get withdrawal effects coming off of antidepressants. These are not medications without consequences. Do I really want to be starting a huge number of people on these drugs when we're expecting failure? I don't think so. Now lastly, before I sign off, I'm going to talk about one last report that I saw in New Scientist and this really warmed my heart. This was about parental burnout. This is something that I've been waiting to see in a medical or scientific journal for a really long time. Now, that's not the kind of subject that should make you feel happy inside. But as we've been talking about burnout in general over the last 12 months on the Hot Topics course, and in the ICD-11 categorization of or classification of diseases, it is very specifically an occupational phenomenon. But it's clear to me, as someone with young children, from introspection, from looking at friends and family who also have gone through the same experiences, and not all of them having come out intact on the other side, the idea about burnout being purely an occupational phenomenon is far, far, far too narrow. So I was really, really happy to see that someone out there is actually researching parental burnout. So this is a genuine thing. People becoming exhausted, fatigued, cynical, negative, emotionally distanced and low. This has been reported to affect up to 8% of parents in Western countries. Although interestingly, there's a huge cultural thing going on here because in some countries, and the report highlights uh, a number of African countries, there's virtually zero burnout. And there seem to be lots of different things going on here. Some of it is um, support. So for people who are living in shared houses with multi-generation houses, that support is going to be a protective factor. 
but there are risk factors and a big one may be expectation expectation that this is meant to be a really joyous time and when it's not when it's a pain in the ass when it's a massive struggle people start feeling bad about themselves as a result and they found that all the advances in child behavioral psychology and all the millions of parenting help books that you can get now to drive your child to its true, true potential actually they can be um, they can have a very negative impact on parents when they fail to meet those expectations and when I think about friends I know who've had children and have had difficulties particularly in those early days with their kids which have sometimes ended in divorce sometimes they've ended in major life changes whether that's moving area or changing jobs in search of something to try and relieve the burden, it's clear that parental burnout has been a major driver in a lot of this. So this isn't currently recognised as an official disease, but it is a real phenomenon. And there are things that can help, the most important of which is simply recognising that this is a real problem and then talking about it. And I'm not suggesting that, that people need to come to the doctor. And if you're experiencing this, you don't need, necessarily need to go to the doctor. But um, talking about it in a group or even just with friends, even with your partner, can make a big, big difference. Lockdown has been challenging for many, many people. The last 10 days with my three-year-old has taught me that. So the other big thing that can help is just to go easy on yourself. If they haven't learned equations and Japanese yet, it's okay. If they watch a bit of extra TV today, it's okay. They'll still be fine when they're grown up. Okay, on the next podcast, we have got an interview with Terry Kemple. So Terry's a GP in Bristol. He works with the RCGP, but recently his focus has been on the climate emergency. So we'll be chatting about how practices can get involved, how that can save practices money, and how it can help improve the lives of your patients as well. Do take a look at the MB Medical website. We've got lots of courses coming up over the next few weeks. I'm going to be doing a course on post-COVID live on the 9th of February. We've got our cancer course coming up on the 6th of February. We've got the current actual Hot Topics course on the 30th of January as well, once again live. So do join us for those. And as ever, please do get in contact. You can email us, hottopics at mbmedical.com. You can find us on Twitter, at GP Hot Topics and at Dr. Neil Tucker. You can find us on our Facebook page as well. Let me know how you're getting on. I hope you're doing well out there. And unless my bubble bursts again, I'll hope to be back in a couple of weeks. See you then. Bye-bye.